Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, we're going to have very intensive two hours, so I want to hit the crown running. Um, I want to share with you something we learned over the past few years about how entrepreneurs, how startup entrepreneurs do strategy. These findings are interesting because they are reflections of large company executives helping the startup entrepreneurs. So these are the people from big companies who've been helping startup entrepreneurs as advisors. And this is how they see the entrepreneurs' challenges in doing strategy. It's pretty tough. You're trying to balance very conflicting targets in short term, long term, try to figure out what to do and all these under huge uncertainties. Welcome again. My name is Tapio Peltonen. I'm the founder, entrepreneur in EEX uh, startup. And happy to see you all here today. Um, we're also happy to work with the technology industries of Finland. This is pretty unique collaboration, a small startup and a technology industry association, uh, which represents some 1,600 of our best tech companies, uh, also more than half of Finland's exports. So we are showing example for others how to collaborate. Uh, thanks for that. I'm going to go through the program of the day very quickly. We will start with a couple of sharps sharp keynotes and then discuss a wider panel setting. Uh, we're going to have a small break after which we will be joined by Rita McCrad from all the way from New York. And we will round off the event with a fireside chat between Rita and Risto. Okay, we're going to test the system, we can do polls, and I'm going to launch the first poll right now. Uh, please vote, tell us from what kind of organization you're from. You are over 600 signed up from over 400 organizations from, I think, a couple of dozens of countries. A quite remarkable, a big event for a startup like ours. And we're going to get results about, yes. Okay. And we had, of course, technical, little technical glitch. Thanks for voting so uh, actively as you're, you actually crashed the voting system. Um, brilliant. Thanks a lot. So moving along, the discussion is already on in Twitter and in LinkedIn. So please join the discussion. We're going to use hashtag collaborate for growth. And uh, I know that you have a lot to say about this subject. So please join us in the discussion in Twitter. Um, you were very kind of answering all the questions in the, uh, at the registration. We had over 300 answers from you guys. Um, and first and most striking, more than three quarters of you think that you need to do something about your strategy within a few months. So I guess this event is timely. A couple of words about ourselves for those who don't know what EEX is. We are a startup. Our mission is to make the world more entrepreneurial, more open to collaboration, more agile, uh, more courageous, uh, more entrepreneurial, in a word. What we do is that we combine, we take large company leaders, they join the startup entrepreneurs to learn together in a startup setting. And a startup is a very pretty unique setting because 
in terms of learning, the startup has only one mission, is to learn a business. Startup either learns a business or dies. Hence, it's a good place to learn business. And this all is very important because at the end of the day, it's people who make things happen. People take ideas, slides and studies and turn them into real stuff, real solutions, real products and services that make value. And we work with these people who lead many of these developments. This is why we do it. How we do it is that you think Steve Blank, Steve Blank said famously that there are no answers in your office. Get out of the building. This is exactly what we do. Uh, big company executives join us out of the building. We deploy them into startup advisory boards to help the startup entrepreneurs, several people from several companies, and to learn themselves, grow as leaders. Seems simple. Um, I'm very proud of our community. We have we have about the best people from these companies working with us. Uh, incredibly dynamic, proactive, curious, learning-oriented people. Um, very diverse group in that. Uh, we have almost all industries. We have even different sectors um, and functions. And we work with about the best companies. Uh, here you see can, you can see some of our, our partners. We've been working with over 60 companies right now. We have people helping out there, helping startup and entrepreneurs as we speak. This is pretty cool. So what we do is that we sharpen the entrepreneurial minds and leaders of the big companies. This is how we intend to save the world as a startup. And this is how also through these people how strategies become real, they get realized. Hence the entrepreneurial leadership being important. Back to the program of today, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our first guest, who is Arun Agarwal from Portum. He is very experienced transformation leader with pretty interesting history. Welcome Arun. Thank you, Tapio. Well, Tapio, thank you for inviting me to this event. Um, and thank you, everybody, for giving me about 15 minutes of your life. Uh, hopefully, what I can do is talk a little bit about um, how I come from, you know, in the last eight years, I have worked in two very age-old industries, construction and building materials and electricity. And the question is, what do these have to do with transformation? The answer is quite a lot. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what we have done and where we're going. And hopefully that'll inspire you, all of you people working in smaller, faster, newer industries, that if we can transform these companies, there's opportunity in every single company to go forward. Okay? Uh, so first of all, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Fortum. Um, and guess what? Fortum is about a five and a half billion euro company, provides energy in about 10 countries. We have about 200 power plants of different types in, uh, all, over, all across Europe and some in Russia and Poland and the Baltics. And the numbers you see on this chart, I hate to tell you, are completely wrong. And they're completely wrong simply because we just actually purchased another company that we're finishing consolidating into Fortum, which basically will take these numbers and triple all the numbers you see up there. So we will be a company that has it's about 20 billion in assets, about 45 billion in assets with a EBIT that is uh, somewhere north of two and a half billion as a company. But what we do is essentially fairly simple. We provide electricity and heat to our customers. Yes, we have a retail business, but that's what we do. But let's take this simple business and see how it is changing. So if I go to the next slide, if I look back 30 years ago, how did electricity work? You had a nuclear power plant, some hydropower plants, you burn some coal, and you put some energy on the grid, you provided it to the customer and we owned it all. 
let's fast forward. And by the way, back then, when you did a plan of how to run your power plant, you did a plan a week ahead and said, this is how I'm going to run my power plant every week. And if something changes, you know, we'll adjust. Let's look fast forward today. Today, we have all of the same old power plants, but on top of that, we have hundreds of solar power plants, wind power plants that we never used to have in the past. We have cars charging in the network. We have batteries. We have storage. And by the way, all of these can actually not just consume energy, but also provide energy. So what used to be a fairly simple system, you want more, we just run things up, burn more stuff, has now become in this entirely complex system with thousands of pieces. And guess what? We don't have control over all of them because we don't know when the sun is going to shine. We don't know when the wind is going to blow. But you, using your computer, expect to plug in and still get your 220 volts, 50 hertz all the time. So to make that happen is an incredibly complex task. And this is where we are transforming to becoming much more of a digital company. If I go to the next slide, what you see here is just simply how we run power plants, okay? We start with uh, just taking a look at our power plants and saying what's available in terms of energy. And we look at this six months to a year out. Then we do a forecast. And the forecast is of how much we can produce and what the demand is. And that forecast takes a look at everything from the weather to the prices of commodities to what the demand is going to be for different types of customers, residential, industrial, et cetera. Then we also uh, get very far down in the details of economic projections, et cetera. And what that tells us is how much energy we want to sell in advance, how much we want to reserve, where can we get the best value. Then we have real-time data coming in on consumption of all of this electricity. And we make decisions by the minute of what energy to trade on an open market. And based on that trading decision, we operate a power plant. We send a message to somebody, he operates the power plant and then shuts it off. And then we measure how much power is generated and that creates a billing and all that. Imagine doing this, and this is just for hydro. Now imagine having to do this with thousands of assets in real time. In the old world, we did a plan to operate a power plant one way for days in advance. The future, power plants will have to be operated differently every 15 minutes and in some places every five minutes. No human being can keep up with this much information and do all of these things. So that means we have to invest in completely new forecasting systems. We built forecasting and planning models that took eight hours to run to give you one scenario. We now need to generate 10 scenarios in under 15 minutes to operate. And that means a completely new types of AI and ML based models that are going to have to be built. We're going to have to automate the trading process because no trader can keep up with the demand that fast. We're going to have to take and connect all of these decisions to actual systems in the power plant because no human being can turn power plants up and down as fast. And this entire transformation is what one of the big projects that we're working on right now. And what's the amazing thing is to do this transformation, we have people internally from within Fortum, but we also have a tremendous number of startups that we are collaborating with to do this. So if you, if you heard me talk about forecasting, it's actually a startup out of California that we found that we invested in, whose tool is now doing most of our demand forecasting. And a process that we used to do in-house is now being done by a small startup in California. And somebody would say forecasting is core to what you do. Yes, but we have to be open to new ideas that come from the outside. We have another company that is doing remote inspections of our plants using drones and another one doing using satellites to take a look at the flow of hot water through the network to see if there's leakages. All of these are amazing startups that are contributing to this. And so we invest a ton of money in startups 
both internal ideas that people come up with that we turn into little startups and incubate them, to external startups that are venturing on fines and brings in. And it is taking the need to transform our industry along with all these amazing ideas from startups that is driving us forward. And this is, remember, an age old electricity company. Uh, I spent a couple of years in another business that was just as old and just as bad. It was the construction materials business. Let me try to describe the construction materials business. Number one, it is the most manual, partly corrupt, business on the planet okay and corrupt not in the sense that that way is just a it's a network of old boys network business and that's what it is and if you want to buy say cement or concrete from a construction materials company this is generally how it works across the industry you call us you get an account that takes about a week then we have to do a credit check and get to know your entire history that takes about another two weeks and then you want to order cement from us, and guess what? That takes another two weeks to get an order. It takes five weeks for you to place your first order. And then when we're going to be delivering that order, we have to do 50 phone calls to know where you are. As a company, we could, this company could have chosen, oops, sorry, I didn't move on to this. This company chose that instead of building a new power plant, sorry, a new cement plant, which costs half a billion euros. We're going to invest in digitally transforming our company. We put almost 500 people in the company from inside and outside working together to build a completely new automated process for how cement and concrete is purchased and sold. Today, that crazy process I described to you can be executed in an app in five minutes flat. And you can get a commitment to go in and once you're a registered customer, to buy a couple millions of euros of cement or concrete and get absolute certainty that three months from now, on so-and-so morning, it will be delivered to your construction site by 200 trucks coming every two minutes. And you have full transparency of that in real time. And that's how it works today. So we took one of the oldest products in the world, cement, been made since Roman times with no change and decided to invest in transforming that business. Okay. And imagine this, a company of that size, about 15 to 18 billion in revenue, a hundred percent of the orders before this came in manually through phone calls and conversations with salespeople. 80% of their orders worldwide now flow through a completely digital process with little to no human intervention. It's possible. So my whole thing is, it is possible, but what it took, and this is the heart of it, it took a CEO brave enough to say, the bigger and better investment is in transforming our company and getting more out of our assets than just going and building another power plant or another cement plant. Mm -hmm. And personally led this effort to get it done. Without that, whether it was Semex or Fortum, none of this would have moved forward. And interesting, I'm going to go to another slide, another transformation. We keep talking about COVID. So I just asked my group the other day, hey, how many of you would actually like to come back to work full time in six months or a year? And the results that we got were a bit surprising. Look, I'm an old fashioned guy. I like to be in the office. And what we got was 40% would like to continue to work from home almost full time. And almost 90% would like to work two to three days a week, part-time at home. And this is revolutionary. So everything I talked about digital transformation in the past has to move even faster to enable us. We have, to, and that means we have to change how we provide remote access, how we provide collaboration tools. Yes, today everybody's talking about Zoom and Teams and all that, but that's not good enough. We have to provide them even more collaborative tools where they can design and draw and put up stuff together in completely new ways. We're going to have to change the handsets and tools we give them to go home. And all of this is creating a security nightmare. And that means revamping all of our technology and security and working with completely new companies and startups to provide specific solutions. And one last thing, what's the interesting thing that has changed? 
Remember when I talked about automating our process end to end? The fear has always been, but we need the human at the power plant to do something. They have to be a circuit breaker. And in literally three months, the mindset shift. The human is great, but we need the technology as a backup because what if the human doesn't show up? And that means everything we wanted to do drives end-to-end -end automations moving forward even faster. So thank you. And I'll be joining you a little bit later for a few minutes at the table. Thank you, Arun. Uh, wonderful stuff and goes to show that transformation is perfectly possible if it's possible in industries like <clears throat> cement. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mario Miettinen, uh, who's chairing the board of Technology Industries of Finland, but is very interestingly also a family company owner, entrepreneur herself. Mario, welcome. Okay, hi everybody. I have to say that uh, this time it was really, really nice to come to Helsinki and be physically present behind the cameras because I have been now living eight months, eight weeks in Finnish archipelago. First of all, I want to thank EEX, Tapio and the whole team for inviting me for this exciting webinar. I will explain some of my experiences about strategy work over and how Corona has affected to this all. My point of view, as Tapio said, is more family business perspective. So I like to talk about the roles between owners, board and management. And what kind of time horizons these three roles have? During Corona, all these roles has been extremely useful. For me, strategy is a process, not a project. This process is a combination of continuous planning and executing, and it is evolving all the time. Then and then, of course, you need to revise your strategy totally, especially when there occurs big changes outside the company. And Corona, of course, is an example for this. One good idea for your strategy process could be that leave empty space or lines without text for your visual strategy maps. This empty space is a mark for you that there will be issues and facts around the corners, as Rita says. This activate you and people your people to ask about these empty boxes and maybe also to give you new innovative ideas. I also suggest that we all increase our mega trends with one new trend and this is crisis resilience. Some companies will now survive from Corona great, some okay, some with totally new direction and unfortunately some of the companies will go bankruptcy. The good thing is that also new companies with new ideas will be established. As a business owner, I have four things all the time in my mind. And those four things are business, capital, people and reputation. First business. Do you have a local? international or global, as Aru was telling about Fortum, is it scalable or is there a new technology or service replacing your business within 10 years? With capital, I simply mean, do we have money enough to develop our business as planned? Then in the end, your business is dependent on people and especially right people to your specific business. Reputation for me means that everything we do, we do in the right way for our customers, employees, stakeholders and societies. Trust capital is the key for this. In our business, 
ENSTO, we have separated two strategies. One for owner strategy and one for business strategy. Owner strategy is made by owners and includes seven concrete topics. First, commitment to the business, teamwork, good decision making, continuous learning. We want our company to be a forerunner, especially technology. Sustainability is core for everything we do and we will build a successful company together with all ENSTO people. ENSTO, by the way, uh, provides smart electrical solutions for electricity distribution networks, so Fortum, for example, <laughs> buildings, marine and electric traffic, and we uh, employ 1,400 employees, turn over 260 uh, euros. We have subsidiaries in 18 countries. So business strategy is done by the management and board, but owners are always involved when big directions are chosen. Ensto is 62 years old and can, I can ensure that uh, there has been big changes several times even. Uh, our core competence uh, is still valid. When Corona crisis started to affect all of us, the interesting thing was that in our company, owners, board and management, they all keen to give everything out uh, for our new scenario planning. Everyone was needed because we didn't have too much time. I really believe that Corona crisis has strengthened uh, our team spirit. Remember that communication is the basic thing to build trust. Just now, we have three different time horizons ongoing in the same time. First, a survival game. This is typically a, a case for management. Time span around weeks and up to one year. Planning adjustments, positive cash flow, safe workplace, possible layouts, etc. Second, corona exit strategy and especially how to restart the next growth again. This has been in Ensto a board case together with management, of course. Board's horizon is now more in year 2021 and forward. Different scenarios about the new normal for our business. Time span one year to three, five years. Then third, new normal from, from owner's perspective. And how does the company look like after five years? Can this business be stronger and bigger after this crisis? Where to invest? What is our focus, values, ethical guidelines, etc.? The main question is, of course, are we still committed to this business? Shall we keep the business or not? The problem with us family owners, business owners, is that we start to love our business too easy. This can lead to problems because then you don't see the weak signals in and outside your company. I really believe the future is smart and we need to be smart too. I wish you all interesting strategy and scenario sessions with many new innovation. Have a nice day. Thank you, Mario. Now we will have uh, a discussion, a panel discussion uh, between three of us. I will help to guide. Um, thanks again for all the questions you've, you've sent us. Uh, I'm afraid we can't, we can't for our lives, we can't handle all of them. Uh, the wonderful questions that we keep coming back to them. Um, great stuff from both of you. Um, but the kick off the discussion is that how do you know that you actually have to rethink your strategy? Uh, maybe your old strategy is perfectly okay. Where do you know 
if you need to change your strategy. Harold, would you like to start? Um, I think uh, <clears throat> I think something that Mario said is strategy is not something that you start and finish. It's not projects it's an ongoing process of change. So I think we at Fortum, for example, revisit our strategy every six months mm -hmm. to a year. We definitely go through an annual strategic planning process, but uh, we're looking at it all the time. And it starts with looking at what's happening in the outside, not inside Fortum necessarily. What's happening outside Fortum in the markets we serve? What is happening to the customers we serve? And from there, we start building back. We also take a very deep look at our competition and what they're doing. And based on that, we are then formulating our strategy based on our strengths, our assets, and how we can position them to be effective in the future. Okay, so it starts with the customer. Mario, how do you, how do you feel? When, you, when do you know that you have to now rethink the whole thing? I, I think same that you, you need to be active all the, all the time. Of course, Corona is so special case now that, uh, that uh, we also rethought uh, a little bit our strategy. And, and uh, the interesting case was that we thought that our strategy is more powerful now after <laughs> this than it was actually before. So, so we will survive this uh, quite uh, good. The turnover goes down and profit goes this year a little bit down. But everybody, uh, it's a fundamental basics in your life, electricity. So, so it's needed. So we are in a good business. Okay, I think I agree with Mario yes, on this one I because so. <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, I think one of the amazing things I see is you read in the newspapers that everything now is looking clean. There's no smog. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Mm -hmm. That's mostly because of the polluting things that we used to do. So in the future, I think the people are going to demand we can't go back to that point. Mm -hmm. And what we think of, at least at probably Ensto and Fortum, I, can't, I don't want to speak to you, is that a big component of decarbonization is going to be moving to electrification of various industries. And we think that's going to accelerate. So yes, we're going to have pain in the middle here due to COVID and reduced demand. But we are hopeful that this will come back even more strongly and quickly because people are not going to want to go back to that old well, this is awfully interesting. So you're, you're both saying, almost the same way, that a could can come out of the crisis. And Mario, congratulate if you have, this is this is, could probably make the Nassim Taleb's anti-fragile, um, your strategy, if it's actually better in this situation. The whole point of being that you actually excel in, in the crisis. Um, so you think, you, you both think that the could can, could can come out of this crisis, Mario? Yes, for sure, for sure. And and this energy efficiency is also one part of the cost savings. So you can re reduce the cost savings at home and also in in uh, the companies. So uh, this this is good for for ev everybody. But there is there is of course a lot lot to do, and and we we will learn a lot from this corona crisis. The worst case uh, for this is that we will go into the financial crisis after this corona and that will take then a long period and, and that's what I'm afraid of. Yeah, the economic, economic, the economic outcome, yeah. outcome or outfall can be, can yeah. be uh, quite big. We don't quite know yet. I mean, economists yeah. are disagreeing of whether we have V-shape or L-shape or we, uh, shallow U-shape uh, recovery. Um, as an entrepreneur, I think the, the recovery is what, what, what we make it, I mean, basically. Um, but of course, it's something we all will have to do. Now, Arun, you, you said that you're doing lots of startup collaboration. Can you decipher, open up a little bit, why do you put so much energy in the startup collaboration? Simply, we don't have all the ideas. And we can't have all the ideas and we can't have all the experts and we depend on that ecosystem to provide us the ideas and the expertise that we okay. need. And then there's the other side. We do truly believe that financially 
that some of the investments we make in startup will actually provide even a great financial return. And when we look at startups, I look at it in kind of uh, three buckets. Okay. I look at it as, um, you know, we have a venture fund that we invest in various startups, early stage startups. And many of these hopefully will provide a return, but what they're doing is providing us technology that we can pilot and use in our companies earlier than our competition can to improve what we do. Then we have startups that are great ideas internally that people have, and some of them turn into big businesses. Our entire mobility charging business that we just got an external investor in, I'll say this, tripled the value of what we've invested into it over the last few years. And so it's had a financial return, um, and it's an extremely core part of our business today. And then the third part of it is the small startup ecosystem we have around here in Finland and the Nordics, working with them to encourage innovation. And that does two things for us. One is it keeps, it's, so it's not just the business benefit of uh, new ideas coming in, but it also encourages our internal staff and gives them something to strive for, okay? Which is really important because they see, oh, I can work on this stuff. And it also allows us then to get good talent in because they see, okay, and for companies willing to make this much of an investment, they are forward-looking. And not a lot of people think that the electricity industry is forward-looking. <laughs> but this is, this is wonderful. And, of course, I have to second your opinion about how it encourages the people and uh, to the audience that Fortum is one of our original partners in, in what we do. You've been with us for all six years, wonderful. And you've been helping us in the beginning to set this up, what we're doing. Um, but how does it? How does this startup collaboration play back, or sort of link back to your strategy work? Because some in some companies, it is actually a little bit detached, as you maybe know. I think from a strategic level, we've been very clear that we want to take a certain amount of money, a fairly healthy pot of money, and invest in startups, and to see how what we learn, how can that affect our core business. Um, back to mobility. It was an idea when we started this seven years ago. Nobody talked about uh, co electric cars. There was a <laughs> okay, but let's see how that transformed our strategy. We believe that now this is going to be a massive multi-billion euro market, and we're investing tens of millions a year to build it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to commit to investing maybe another hundred million over the next few years into this area. So it is impacting our strategy. Uh, we also are building an entire software platform that runs uh, mobile charging for companies. And that tells us that we are now starting to get much more into the services business, building specific software mm -hmm. platforms. And part of that is what's our strategy look like? Are we purely an energy company or are we a technology company? So when we turn around and look at, for example, when I talked about the entire mess of what the energy system looks like, we have to build a completely brand new platform to basically optimize this. And one of our objectives, and I'm very clear about it, is we want to build it and then ask other energy companies to use it because the more energy assets that are on the platform, the better results it delivers in terms of being able to optimize power consumption. This is this is wonderful, and of course, highlights are one of. Uh, yeah. We will hear this from Rita also that the the industry borders are blurring. I mean, in, in some of them, especially Rita, they talk about arenas of competition now, and it's not clear in which ones um, you compete. But we have a couple of questions from the from the audience, uh, Mario. You, you said that about the, the, you had a very fine, refined understanding of, of, of how do you define the work of rethinking strategy between the, the management, the board, and the owners. Um, and we have a question here is that how do you keep the owners from interfering the day-to-day -day business? <laughs> I mean, you, you may be the wrong person to ask, but it's, it's, it's something that you, you, you must have thought about it, how much you get involved, especially in the bad times when everybody is, is, is very worried. Well, first of all, I'm really happy we have now third generation as own owners. So they are 20 to 
27 years old and they are really really active so so they they want to <laughs> interrupt the, the all and they have a lot of questions and i'm happy for that when when you have the crisis don't think about so much uh, who is allowed to speak with whom it's better that all the ideas come uh, on the table of course i am very actively communicating uh, with owners and because I'm the chairman of the board for ENSTO also, so I am communicating in that part also. But, uh, but as much as co uh, possible, the communication in all the directions. So this is the, this is the main, main goal. Or I, I would like to say dialogue, because dialogue is more than communication. Dialogue means that if I ask Tapio something, Tapio answers me more than I have asked. And then we continue, I uh, uh, answer Stapios, uh, wide answer and so on. So you get more out of that. So I, I'm happy that everybody is interested and they are active. My son just called me before this webinar and asked, now they are saying thank you from our Estonian company to me, what shall I answer? And say, great, you are doing great your work in, in our Estonian companies. So they are contacting also our owners because they know them. So be active. Be well, active. This, this, for, for startup entrepreneurs, this and this running up practically a small family company, I mean, this sounds very natural. Mm. But of course, there, there can be different situations and different uh, dynamics uh, depending. But something you said uh, touched, uh, uh, and we, we've discussed this before, is about the looking beyond the generations. And I'm awfully interested, awfully interested in this aspect. And uh, how could you, you're looking over to generations. So you're looking over one or two or few crises and possibly in some cases in family companies, you're looking beyond wars and all kinds of crisis times how can we how can you cultivate that thinking of beyond generations uh, the main main boy point of course is when the new generation comes into to the company uh, are they really interested for this electrical business or are they perhaps interested for hotel business or whatever so the real interest for for the business has to be uh, real. Mm -hmm. And and two years ago when we had generation change, we we did uh, a revised owners strategy, and it it was totally uh, new new points and and ideas from the younger generation. Uh, so um, it's ongoing process, as I as I told. This is this is interesting, and, and the point here is that when I learned to you about this, how do you look beyond a generation? I started to think personally that, okay, isn't this what we we need to do as a humankind? Now we're talking about the big crisis looming, like like the the climate change. That how could we learn together to look beyond the organization? I don't know, Arun, if if, if you're holding a, the 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 stone of wisdom for for how to in do this in, in a big company. How do you look beyond generations? Look, unfortunately, we've been fortunate. I mean, we have clearly a vision that we want to decarbonize society and we want to clean, uh, you know, the environment around us. And we've made our investments. In, in the power industry, you have to look about degeneration of it. A power plant has a lifespan of 40 to 50 years. Yeah. So whatever decisions we make today, we know are going to be there for 40 plus years. You build a nuclear power plant, the decisions will stay with you for hundreds of years. So I think we always look at things from that perspective. So when I take, turn around and take a look at just the strategy process we went through, we looked at planning horizons of three years, 10 years, 20 and 40. And we looked at what do we see as happening in society, where is society going? Where is demand going? Uh, what are the products? What? And those are the basis of which we do plan. Now we have to admit, some of it is guesswork. 
Okay, some of it is intuition, but then there's also the hard analysis of what you know is available in the marketplace and where things are going. And we look at it, we struggle with it, we wrestle with it, we argue about it, <laughs> but then we agree to head in one direction and collect behind it. So the wonderful, uh, there would be a lot to learn from this, but it does something. The general idea is that you have to understand your industry, but also the engagement is important. We need to get the next generations engaged um, and people to understand their their impact over the generation, if you like, in terms of the, yeah. the long-lasting investments, which is very well, very tangible. Mario. And, and the nice thing for younger generation is, of course, that uh, they do different kind of questions, mm -hmm. and then they have different kind of network also. So, uh, so combine you yourself <laughs> with the younger generation, you get much more out. Absolutely. The, the, the diversity in, in all yes. forms, and this is the intergenerational diversity, if you like, is, is, is a powerful tool for strategy work as well. I mean, we are charting the future. Um, Arun, there was a question in the audience which says that, how do you see the ideal balance in Fortum between the internal entrepreneurial, entrepreneuring and the external entrepreneurial activities? So investing internal or external this is a wonderful question if you have a startup and then you actually, some you know, of that's what's yourself. interesting is um, I can actually make this fairly simple okay um, given that I actually run both the internal venturing and the external venturing I just take a look at it for spending okay and I can tell you right now it's about 50 50 okay so for every dollar we're spending on external venturing and external investments mm -hmm. we're spending exactly about the same amount on internal startups and internal venturing um, and the reason for that is internal venturing means you're, you're paying for the whole venture yeah. to get started. With the external venturing, you get a bit more breadth because you're making smaller investments into multiple companies through a fund. But we're spending about half and half. And I think that is, you know, insofar that I've been doing this with Fortum for about two years, that ratio has been working fairly well. That's very, that's very, that's very interesting. Because the, the, the for lots of organizations, what we see is that the, the difficult moment is that when you have an internal project and then you have a better startup doing it elsewhere, what do you do? We've had that a few times, but in some cases we've had the product, for example, I had a product, you know, when I talked about forecasting, we had a team that kept developing new forecasting models. There was a small little group of wide eyed people, but we found this other company that just did it faster and better. And we did a pilot with them. And what we decided to do, we put this aside, put them on a different project, mm -hmm. and basically did a multi-year contract with this startup that would do our demand forecasting for us. Mm -hmm. In the optimization area, we couldn't find what we needed internally or in okay. the market, but we found a company that had a group of people working on this, but they weren't really happy. We went and bought the entire team. Okay. So, you know, we've done it from both organically within the company yeah. to inorganically buying a team to looking at outside startups. Yeah. There were there were a couple of questions among the, the from the audience about the how do you handle the the politics of you know this renewable and all the infighting. Uh, so we've created something called a growth board. And I have uh, a I've made sure I have a representative from each of our business divisions on it. And then I have a, a few outside people. And what that does is we have a really healthy debate every single month about the entire you know, investment portfolio, uh, because we are investing in the tens and tens of millions. Uh, and we look at it and we debate as what to invest in. And yes, there will be people that push, here's the startup I want to focus on because this may help my division or the others. But the key part is every single one of them show up for every single meeting every month and they have a voice and that's what keeps them that's what keeps them bay. Yes, there's politics, but they get solved at the end of the day. Okay. This is this this is wonderful. Uh, there was a, also a question is maybe you both could answer to this, is that 
how do you keep in times like this how do you keep the transformation how do you keep the renewal going because there's a huge pressure in some kind some companies uh, hire people called cfos who are pretty adamant about monies um and 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 people try to save of course considering the cash flow situation and the situation the business is in how do you keep or do you have to keep the development goal mario would you like to start Sometimes the strategy can be one sentence, keep the cash flow positive. But if this is your strategy for too long period, then you have problems. With the cash flow. Too. With the cash flow and with the company also. But sometimes focus on that because that is the, the only way to keep your company running after the crisis or so. So uh, otherwise, I want to keep uh, on going the development and, and especially now I, I would love to, to say all to, the, to all companies that try to invest uh, to the development. So this is the, the way how we get everything running uh, next year also. Aaron, what do you think? You're right, the CFO keeps chasing after us. But in some ways, I, I have always driven transformation to get to a certain objective the company has. It's not my objective, it's the company's objective. And that is then shared by that executive team. And one of the things I focus on is we're not going to go build something that does not deliver something tangible every six months or less that I can have a metric that says, here's the value it created. Without that, don't go for it. Now, some of the, you know, teams fight that this, and sometimes it slips from six months to nine months. It's not that important. The important part is that you focus on it, but then you give the team a little bit of leeway to operate exactly. within that, okay? And that's what we do, and that's what keeps it going. So when we talk about this crisis, energy demand has gone down quite dramatically in the market. Currently, yes. Currently. And so somebody would say, ruin, that means just stop everything. We can't. Because there is two pieces. One is some of the projects that we're doing have clear financial benefits that even and in the current condition are actually even more valuable. And so that's what keeps us going. And then it's a hell of a lot of work to keep the owners, uh, the board members, mm -hmm. the CEO, the CFO, all behind it. So yeah. just a ton of communication which in the current environment is also not that easy. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is awfully interesting from both of you is that what I'm hearing is that if you do your homework, if, if your strategy is solid from the outset, if, if you work it right, then even a crisis may not shake you all that much. Am I right? Yes. In our case, in this case, yes. Mm -hmm. Can't speak for every type yes. of crisis, but at least in this crisis, not that much. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's also what you said was Aaron is, is very interesting because when you said that there's a there's you, you're on mission, you have a yes. certain objective you're trying to accomplish, and whether it's six months or and then you have these these milestones you're trying to accomplish, which you can measure, yes. and then in in the process whether it's month here or month there doesn't really matter, but you're on a mission. And of course, we have the whole concept of mission command, leading true missions and leaving the people to figure out how they do it, um, which is very interesting because this is what lots of us in the startups do. We have a mission and then we find just find a way. Um, a wonderful, wonderful stuff. Uh, so how much you guys talk about your with your teams about the mission? Uh, all the time, actually. Um, especially within the crisis, of course, we are talking uh, talking weekly, almost. But when you mission and or vision is is pretty simple and and good, then you go ahead. Better life with electricity. Mm -hmm. This is our vision and mission. It's really yeah. simple. Go we, forward. You know, we talk about our vision and the pieces all the time, but I like the word you use, dialogue. Um, oh. And just funny, sometimes uh, 
I get great ideas and I tell the team, we should do this too. The team's like a room. <laughs> We're overloaded. We got to stick to our vision. And sometimes the teams take on too much and it's me saying, stop. We can't do every idea that you have. So we had this constant dialogue mm -hmm. between me and the team mm -hmm. to say, how do we stay on the straight and narrow? And hopefully one of us catches the other one if we try to lead us astray. Mm -hmm. So healthy, healthy challenging each other. Yeah. But think about the situation, no new ideas. Nobody coming to you and saying, is this a yeah. good or not? This is a catastrophe. Now what you, human and, and Mario, I'm, I, I, Yes, true, that would be a catastrophe. But what we know of people, people come up with ideas, people want to do new stuff. The people actually want to be entrepreneurial, lots of people, which is wonderful. And to the end, to round this up, um, ah, there is a question uh, from the audience. Uh, and the question goes like this, CEOs in the current situation, are they essentially like the chief transformational officers now? in this situation? Is the CEO's role different in amidst the crisis? Yes, just now when the crisis are, are, are on, ongoing because there is so much operative uh, things to, to do, uh, how to work safe and, and uh, uh, so we have closed many, many fa factories. Uh, now we are reopening them, them, them again. There is a lot, a lot. So yes, they are doing this transformation so that we will survive this year. So is there a competition within Portugal? Who's the transformational lead? I don't know. I saw this little uh, Facebook thing, you know, where they said, who's driving the transformation in your company? CEO, CFO, CIO, COVID. Depending, <laughs> depending, depending on the size of the company. Of but in course. this case, it is COVID that's <laughs> yes. driving the transformation. Okay. <laughs> corona is driving it. Well, the Corona is driving a lot of change. Uh, and as you said, uh, some of that could be for the better. Now, I will end this by asking you both the same question I'm going to ask everybody, because uh, among the 100, 150 questions we got from the audience beforehand, uh, one reoccurring theme was that, okay, we, need, we may need to rethink the strategy. Um, what do I do first? Ladies first. Ladies <laughs> first. Uh, of course, you start to, uh, to collect ideas and, and do the dialogue with the uh, right uh, persons. And, and uh, we have this uh, owners, owners and, and board and then management. And, and management group is thinking about then board and then also owners. And then we are collecting all the I ideas uh, together and having very, very open communication. So this is uh, usually how it uh, starts in our company, at least. How do, how do you feel? Okay, just to extend uh, what Mario said, you know, we've got to bring the people together. We've got to get the best ideas out of them. But then we also spend quite a bit of time kind of getting a lay of the battlefield. What does the battlefield look like? And what do we see happening? And I think you've got to take those two pictures and start putting them together. And that's what strategy, I think, is. Okay, now we know what the battlefield looks like, what we see is going to happen, and what do we aspire to do, and what are the great ideas we have. Merging that then becomes a strategy. The hard part then becomes focus, because you have so many good ideas that you can pursue, but you have limited human capital and limited financial capital. And so then this is where the board and the owners really play a big role, which is saying, where do we want to take the bet and put the capital out? That is terrific, difficult because times like this, where do you focus or not? Wonderful, wonderful discussion. Uh, uh, big thanks to you all. I'm sure that our audience would join us for a big hand for you guys. Um, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thanks a lot for both of you. Now, for our audience, we're heading to a break. Uh, after the break, we will have Rita McCraw joining us from New York, and we will do a little poll.
provided the tech allows. Uh, don't go far. We have five minutes, so we will continue 15.08 sharp Helsinki time. Thanks a lot. Welcome back. Uh, we were looking for your favorite method for looking how to look around the corner. And uh, thanks a lot for answering. Uh, and the, and the uh, results say that, excuse me, your favorite method is to use your imagination. Quite wonderful. Uh, thanks a lot for voting. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker all the way from New York. Rita McGrath is arguably one of our top, if not the first, uh, strategy thinker uh, in the world currently. She has done a marvelous work with both strategy and innovation since 90s. And uh, we're honored to have her to join us tonight to discuss uh, about how can we reinvent or rethink our strategies. Uh, Rita, you're very welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi there. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I, I'm agreed on all levels. Can you hear me, Tapia? Yes. Excellent. You hear us. Great. I can hear you. Well, hello, Helsinki. Go ahead. It's a, a pleasure to, oh, a real pleasure to be here. Hi. Um, so I was asked to make some comments on the new strategy playbook, which I'm happy to do. And I think you have my slides there somewhere. Yes, no? There we go. Um, so the the overarching theme of this conversation is really that um, you know we used to believe in strategy in a thing called sustainable competitive advantage, and the idea was once you found a great position in a terrific industry, you then exploited that position for a long, long time. And what we have learned in the intervening period is that competitive advantages, as our previous panel has just illustrated, are increasingly short. You know, you, you go from an energy company, right, that, that has a very predictable um, business. You have one customer, essentially, it's your, your rate setters. Uh, and, and the rest of the time, it's all about operational excellence. Well, that whole model has been completely blown up. And so we really need to be thinking of a very different way of making strategy and making strategy work. Um, so I think the, you know, what happened here? No, I didn't want that. Okay. So I think the, um, the, the world really looks very, very different and it looks um, a lot more like this. So this is an example of, um, market share shifts in the gaming business. And so in the beginning, what you had was arcade games, right? And, and you had to go to a physical place and throw money at this refrigerator sized machine. Um, and each game was really expensive. And the game and the intelligence behind the game were combined. You know, they were analog. So, you know, the, the game could only function, um, you know, as an entity. And then the next big shift that happened was you had a separation of the intelligence behind the game and the uh, machinery on which the game ran. And that opened up a whole new vector of opportunity. So you started to have games you could play at home. You had games that you could play, you know, wherever you went. Then the next form factor was you had little games, right? You could bring them with you and sit at the dinner table and, you know, game away. And then you had games that could be played on multiple purpose machines, like Windows machines and so forth. And, 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 and. And today, of course, we have games that can be played in the air, games that are played on virtual reality devices, games that are played all over. Um, and so I think um, the, the pattern is what I think is really important here, which is this idea that we have these waves of competitive advantage, that you have a period of time in which an advantage is created, a period of time in which uh, hopefully you get to sort of enjoy that advantage, and then a period of time in which it goes into erosion. And you can see that very clearly uh, with the gaming 
kind of um, business. And that's really the world of this new strategy playbook that I was trying to um, illustrate in my in my my, my previous book. Um, so the elements of this playbook are, uh, I, I, and I think the previous panel really illustrated this beautifully. So the first issue is we've gone from a world where we assume stability is the normal thing to a world where we assume that change is the normal thing. And that requires a certain degree of strategic uh, agility. You need to be able to reconfigure your resources. You need to be able to uh, shift things around. So that's the, the first point. Second point is we need to get a lot more comfortable with what I call healthy disengagement. And what I mean by that is the ability to withdraw resources from things that are either eroding or not really taking off or going forward. And in most organizations, even today, disengagement is a process which is really painful. We wait far too long to do it. Um, we, you know, when it finally happens, we're so relieved it's over that we just sort of shove it all under the rug and we never talk about it again. And yet I would argue that what you want is you want a world where disengagement happens in a very healthy way, meaning everybody understands it, it's very transparent, it, um, it, 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 we, we look for opportunities to recoup what perhaps was valuable about the thing we're disengaging from, and, and so forth. So I think healthy disengagement is going to become very important as a um, principle going forward. Then we have to think about uh, resources, and Arun put it really well, you know, I need to look at my whole portfolio, what am I investing in? And I need to manage that dynamically. And in most organizations, Resources get stuck, you know, they get stuck in divisions, they get stuck in projects. At a senior level, you hardly have a line of sight into where your resources are going. Then we need innovation, but innovation as a proficiency. And I would say most organizations that I work with anyway, um, are still at the stage of what I'll call innovation theater. <laughs> you know, so we, we emulate Silicon Valley and we have these innovation boot camps and thousands of post-it notes go on the wall and you know, that's all great. But we don't really take it to the next level, which requires incubation. So really building the future innovation um, in, in a very systematic way and then acceleration. When you've discovered something that works, you have to bring it to scale. I mean, you have to get it to really be um, something that can become part of your future. Then we have very new implications for leadership. We need leadership that is what I call discovery driven. It, you know, take in new information, um, be able to respond and react, be willing to accept uncomfortable data. That's really important. Um, and so a leadership that really is inclusive, that promotes psychological safety, that allows information to flow, a very different kind of leadership than the sort of command and control, you know, I tell you what to do and you do it sort of leadership. And then lastly, this has big um, implications for uh, careers, for talent. Uh, and increasingly, we're living in a world that's a, a much more of a tour of duty world, which Reid Hoffman talks about in, you know, that, that what we're, what we're looking at is careers that may or may not be permanently tied to one company uh, for a long time. And so it, it introduces a lot of new challenges with respect to how we manage talent and manage each other in those environments. So another big shift that we're seeing in strategy is we're going from a concept of industry um, and, and, you know, there's still a lot of very blinded thinking about industries uh, to a concept that I call arenas. So with an industry framework, you're really looking at an established industry, uh, established set of players, an established business model. And set, you, you know, you're, you're looking at something that is right. And, and human beings have made this up, by the way. God does not come down and say this is an indus industry. Um, and when, when you're looking at an arena, in, in contrast, you're really looking at a pool of resources that's available to you and a way of competing that might be completely different. So I think the big learning point here is the most important competitor you face is often not from your own industry. It, it's some other industry that comes in and makes what you do less valuable or less relevant or less important uh, to an end set of customers. Um, so I think, I think it's really important to remember that industry does not determine your fate the way that classical strategy may have thought it was. Now my most recent book 
looks at what I call strategic inflection points. And this was a topic that Andy Grove very famously explored um, many years ago in a wonderful book called Only the Paranoid Survive. <laughs> and he talked about an inflection point as a 10x change in something that you take for granted about your business. And the thing is, any business um, grows up with a set of assumptions that are dictated by what is possible at the time. So an example would be retail, you know, tr tr traditional retail for thousands of years has been driven by the fact that how much you sold depended on how much real estate you had. So all the um, metrics, all the uh, dictators of success in those businesses were driven by how well you use that real estate. So all your metrics were things like same store sales and stores, you know, sales per square foot and inventory turns and all that kind of thing. And the once we had the internet, right, once that constraint was lifted, now the metrics are different. The behavior is different. The customer shopping is different. And yet, if you're looking at the world through that lens of this industry that's been created, you can really miss those shifts. And I think that's a really important um, pointer to remember in these very turbulent times is the lenses that you grew up with, as it were, in, in a particular industry may no longer reflect reality. So if I take something very simple, like the invention of YouTube, right back in the, I guess about 10 years ago, 15 years ago now, um, and when YouTube was first commercialized, did titans of industry say to themselves, oh my God, this is an innovation that's going to destabilize the media industry and it's going to completely change the way advertising is done and it's going to dramatically shift the power balance between news organizations and everybody else. No, you know, when YouTube first started, what was it? It was cat videos. <laughs> A lot of it still is cat videos. Um, but if you think about it, 30 years ago, if you wanted to get a video message to a million people, 10 million people, more than that. You had to be a media empire. You know, you had to own all these assets. You had to own a production company, satellites and, and, and you know, big distribution arms. Today, literally two kids in a garage with a reasonably priced smartphone can get a video message to hundreds of millions of people at virtually no cost. Now that's a real inflection point. It changes the nature of what we're doing in society. Um, so I think one of the things that is really important now uh, as we think about moving forward is that the whole world has been shoved into this world that I've kind of lived in my whole life, which is the world of relatively high assumptions relative to knowledge. So you've got a high assumption to knowledge ratio situation. And what I would say is human beings demonstrably are terrible at processing assumptions. We we have blind spots, we, we have something called the confirmation bias where we make assumptions because we already know what we want the outcome to be. So we go looking for evidence that we're right. <laughs> you know? We don't really take in facts. Um, so what we want to do is really be thinking about how do I convert these assumptions to knowledge at the lowest possible cost and as quickly as I possibly can. And I call this discovery driven planning. Um, and the idea there is what you want to do is take a wide range of assumptions, which you want to test at very low amounts of money and time. And as you are creating more knowledge, that's when you could allow your investment to increase. So I would argue right now what we're dealing with in, you know, just in business, in normal life, is we're all in this mode of trying to convert assumptions to knowledge as quickly as we possibly can. So I think that's a real principle to take with you as you, uh, um, you know, think about your strategy going forward. Um, so a couple of final observations. Uh, you know, when I first started in the field of strategy, all the cool kids were doing industry analysis. You know, it was all order of entry and R&D intensity and those kinds of studies. And those of us studying innovation were <laughs> sort of huddled in the corner for warmth because, um, you know, we were looking inside firms and we were doing, you know, individual company analyses and trying to figure out how companies worked. Well, I think because of this phenomena of transient or, or shortened competitive advantage, Strategy and innovation have really come together in a very meaningful way to the point where you really can't talk about strategy without talking about innovation. You can't really talk about innovation without it 
connecting to your strategy in some major way. And then all of this, I think, has been heavily influenced by a digital overlay. So innovation today always seems to have a digital component to it. And so I think these three things are really coming together in a, in a very meaningful way. So I'll, I'll wrap up my remarks here. Um, for those of you that would like to um, dig more deeply. I'm on all the normal social channels and all the links are there. Um, I do publish a monthly newsletter and this year <laughs> all my plans like so many of ours have been thrown up in the air. So this year what I'm trying to do with each newsletter is put together a tool or a concept or a framework that you'll find actually useful. So this month's is about um, how to conduct an experiment. You know, how do you conduct an experiment in business? Um, I also this uh, time have been um, doing these Friday fireside chats, which have been super fun. <laughs> you know, I invite people who I think have an interesting perspective and, and we spend an hour together on a Friday. They're free. They're, they're, you know, free to attend and just uh, join in. Uh, you can find the, uh, the upcoming ones on my website and the uh, previous ones are all on YouTube. So um, with that, I will turn you back over to Tapio. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Rita. Sorry about that. You sound Sorry very mysterious. That. You sound very mysterious all of a sudden. <laughs> um, and uh, now we can do, do the our next poll. Are we getting sound? Hi, there we are. <laughs> I have to say, Risto, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Um, <laughs> I've been following your career with in incredible interest. Well, it's great to meet you as well. <laughs> can, can you turn up the volume a little bit? I can barely hear you. Oh, okay. Very good. We are all here each other, I guess. That's progress. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks a lot. And uh, sorry about the, the tech glitch um, happens. Um, wonderful to have you both. Uh, I will just very shortly introduce our second uh, fireside sector, uh, Risto Silasma. You're still the chair of Nokia for one week, mm -hmm. uh, great. But you're originally as well a um, entrepreneur, the founder of S-Secure. So we're great to have both of you. And originally the idea was that you both would have been on stage in August here in Helsinki. Um, maybe we can make that happen a little bit later. By the way, I'm not, not originally an entrepreneur. I think I'm still an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur, is it so? Very good. Um, great stuff. A uh, lot of this coming together. Now, you both have written and spoken about the entrepreneurial leadership. And would I want to bring this to together how how do you see the entrepreneurs work the different situations business development transformation and strategy so to kick off um, a very short and sweet maybe from both of you uh, what is an entrepreneurial leader Rita would you like to start sure uh, I think an entrepreneurial leader is someone who's always looking for new opportunities to deploy the capabilities of their people in their organization. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, I, I like Peter's description of a good leader. Okay. I don't think that's an entrepreneurial leader. Great, we disagree. Because if, if you really take a deep dive into what Different differentiates between an entrepreneurial good leader 
to other types of good leaders. I think the key thing is that the entrepreneur who founds a company, hires people, fires people, is the main owner, feels completely responsible for what the company does, feels a real sense of ownership. And that sense of ownership forces the entrepreneur to take action when things are not okay. It doesn't mean that any other type of leader would not be able to do the same things, but they may be able to sleep better when things are tough. They may think that somebody else will take action. Somebody else will fix things or that I'll, if this doesn't work out, I'll just go and work somewhere else. The entrepreneur can never think that way. And that's the real core difference between the entrepreneurial leader and other types of leaders. There are bad entrepreneurial leaders and good entrepreneurial leaders and good and bad leaders in general. Absolutely. But that sense of ownership, that sense of final responsibility can also make you braver, it can force you to experiment, it can force you to do the unorthodox things, and it can be a real source of power. Rita, what, what would you say to Rista about this? Accountability and skin in the game. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's brilliant. I absolutely think that's brilliant. And and you're right that that you know the one of the more interesting things I think in the way that many of our entrepreneurial ecosystems have grown up uh, is it used to be that investors thought that the entrepreneur was never going to be able to run a large organization, and so it was very common for a long time that when a business got to a certain stage that the entrepreneur would actually be evicted and then quote quote professional management would be installed and i think now we're beginning to realize that that's actually not necessarily appropriate that what you want is a founder leader to carry the business forward exactly because of that sense of of deep ownership you know, deep investment in the business this is this is interesting um so there's no such a uh, disagreement after all. Um, coming back to something you said about the, Rita, about the industries and arenas, how should the companies, when they're starting to rethink their strategies, how do they start to define the arenas? So I think you have to really start with the customer and of, of a concept Clay Christensen developed, which I really like, is called the customer job to be done. And what we're learning is, you know, customers have very predictable jobs to be done in their lives. What's very unpredictable and what changes over time is how those jobs get done. Um, and Risto, I was following a little bit the, you know, the transformation of Nokia uh, in, in the recent years and really thinking about, you know, what is the job that a large client for networking services really needs. Um, and that can be met any number of ways by any number of different competitors. And I think really drilling down into how do we become the preferred choice to get that job done. That's, that's I think, the essence of where you start with this notion of arena type thinking. What's the arena for 5G? <laughs> The networking industry is a very, very technical industry. It's a very complicated dynamic behind the scenes between the operators, the countries, the, the political leaders, the geopolitics, research, standards, patents. In, in a way, it's, it's one of the, the most fun intellectual challenges as dynamics come, but it is also sometimes not that much fun because of the sort of slow moving parts of it based on the, the need to standardize everything, the somewhat oligopolic nature of the customers. And that's a challenge mm -hmm. and it's a positive thing as challenges come, but Sometimes I like things to move faster as well. Mm -hmm. 
to the 5G arena? The 5G is, you know, it's a it's a name for a technology, mm -hmm. and I do believe that it it has started a significant revolution in digitalizing those companies and businesses that have not been already digitalized. Exactly. And that will create a era of productivity growth that will shape the world. So inflection point here. Um, Rita, you spoke about companies engaging in innovation theater. Um, I love theater, but in and mixing it with business is, is not necessarily always good. Do you think there is a, such a thing as a strategy theater as well? Are you asking me? Yes, Rita. Um, yeah, well, I, my friend um, um, put this really, really well. He said, well, you know, the trouble with strategy is when everything's going well, executives say, I don't need it. And when things are going badly, they say, I don't have time for it. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was really very insightful. Um, I think strategy is absolutely crucial because, you know, it, it orients you. I mean, and if you think about what a strategy is for, um, a strategy is really there to help you make the best choices under conditions of limited resources and competition. And that's fundamentally what it's for. And if you don't have a strategy, then any option could be arguably as attractive as any other. So I think it's very important to have a strategy. Now, when I when I talk about that, I don't mean a confining strategy. I mean something that's broad enough that a number of different options might fit, but that's focusing enough that you can make choices. Now, I would almost say that strategy is the choices you have made. Mm -hmm. However, now that we move in, into an increasingly complex arena. Mm -hmm. you know, the unpredictability and complicated nature of things and the combination of those two make things very complex. Strategy changes as well. It's not that you make a set of single choices and then you have one path in front of you that you just walk along. We actually need to have a dynamic space of choices. Mm -hmm. We have a clear idea of what are the preferred choices we want to make, but we have a readiness to make other choices as well if the uncontrollable parts of our business environment make the preferred choices impossible or not optimal. And therefore, we have to deal with a wider space of alternatives. And the question is, how do we change our strategy process in such a way that we not just make those that single set of choices to create our plan, but rather create a number of plans that we are prepared to jump between, if necessary. So scenarios and real options for a food future. Rita, what do you think? That, that works for me. <laughs> that's, <laughs> a, that's definitely the way that I look at the world. So um, with, with respect to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, um, I've been talking about four plausible scenarios that each are possible, right? So one is that we, you know, we develop a, a different sense of the social contract but the economy continues to really struggle. Another is we sort of stay the same and maybe the economy improves. Another is maybe we have a really different rethinking of the relationship between you know, society and individuals um, and, and the economy improves or not. And the thing is, at this particular moment, any one of those is plausible. So you need a strategy that could allow you to adapt in, in, in the light of those different future scenarios. One of the most difficult things is identifying the right scenarios. Yeah. Because you can't deal with hundreds of them. Right, no. <laughs> and it might be that even if you have hundreds of them, you're missing the, the three best ones, the yeah. most important ones, or you're missing the one that will happen. I, I ran an, a fairly interesting process 
just about two weeks ago, I collected a number of people from business, from the academia, economists mostly, from startups and from the government. And what we did was we tried to identify the phenomena, the new phenomena that are observable now during COVID-19, mm -hmm. during the pandemic. What, what is new? And then we started mapping what will be the sort of first level impacts of those phenomena. What do they mean? So, for example, very simple example, it would be the hospitality industry. People are afraid to travel. They may be unwilling to travel. So what are the first level impacts? Of course, you can immediately think about hotels, you think about airlines. What are the second level impacts? Let's say airlines are in financial trouble. In, in Finland, the Finnish national airline Finnair just announced that they will be dropping five Finnish cities from their network. They're not going to fly to those cities at all during this summer. That's a second level impact to those cities and the businesses that exist in those cities. What will be the third level impacts of that? So we started mapping the, the impacts then we prioritized them based on what will be the most significant ones in the short term, one year. Mm -hmm. And what will be the most significant ones in the two, three year time frame. Mm -hmm. And then for each impact, we tried to identify actions that could be, could be taken either to mitigate the negative impact or speed up the positive impact. Utilize it, yeah. And that is an example of a process that may help you identify the right scenarios. You get a lot of data and you can map them in a multi-dimensional space mm -hmm. and you can identify that here's a space where you have sort of lots of impacts that belong in this space. Okay. So maybe that's one scenario that yeah. these will happen. Yep. It's a very typical tool from sort of data analytics or mm -hmm. machine learning to identify the vectors yeah. that are close to each other. And that's something that I, I believe would be a healthy exercise for almost all businesses. To understand the different impacts. But that's a lots of, lots of work. I mean... Um, but that's why we are here, to do lots of work. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but it, there, there is this, there's this issue Focus gets things done, and in business we want things to get done. If we want to find new, if we want to understand different possible routes, we have to look widely. How do you, in times like this, how do you balance the, the need for focus and need to explore, to look new? wants to start. Rita, Rita please <laughs> start. So um, in the early stages of an inflection point, um, what Andy Grove talked about was you need to do, as Risto suggests, just gather as much information as you can, because what you're looking for is a rich kind of database from which you can start to extract patterns. And once the patterns become clear enough that you think you sort of see where where you want to place your bets, that's when you need to have absolute focus. So it's a process of diverging and then converging. Um, and, and I think both have their place. Now, you don't want to diverge forever. I mean, you could swim in data you know, for the rest of your life without ever making a decision. So I think you need to be gathering enough information that the path becomes more clear, and then you have the you know, absolute focus. Um, to, to give an example, I mean, right now, you know, every university in the world is sort of desperately trying to figure out, do we have students come back to campus? What's a university without a campus? <laughs> you know? and, and they're in a very divergent stage right now, but, you know, in a month or two, they're going to have to really figure out what the action plan is going forward because the fall is not going to wait. 
you can also do both at the same time, just organizationally divide them, or mm. distance them. You have the operational leadership that is running the mm. current business. Then you have the top leadership that is thinking about the future. Of course, everyone is involved in that, but it's a question of degree. You also sort of have to continuously do both of these at the same time, but you can build in certain expectations that make it more action oriented. So, for example, as I explained, the process that I, I ran over the last two weeks, for every impact, the participants were asked to identify actions. And actions that we can do right now. Mm -hmm. Not next week, not, not next month, not next year, but right now. And then, of course, you can impose a discipline where you actually expect those actions to be taken once we sort of agree on what scenarios we believe in sufficiently mm -hmm. to start doing something about them. Yeah. But the, you can build a culture where people are action oriented. Mm -hmm. A meeting without some actions coming from that meeting is a really bad meeting. Yeah, we, we, in a startup we call it a party. Um, <laughs> in Finland it's a sauna party. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that has to wait for the next event. Um, I wonder how you would do a virtual sauna. That would be fascinating. <laughs> We were thinking about it, but we couldn't figure it out, really. Um, it, it will have to be audio only. <laughs> that too. Lots of splashing and... <laughs> yeah. Um, coming back to this, this, how entrepreneurs do strategy. And in the very beginning, I, I represented some of the results of how the people we work with, they see the they actually think that the entrepreneurs do strategy differently. And uh, one of these is that they, they for example, they, they talk a lot about the very core issues of strategy, balancing with the different horizons. Um, how do we make a lot to happen with very little resources and prioritization? And they talk about these without mentioning the, the word strategy at all. But it, first of all, we have to remember that startups are completely different animals from existing larger organizations, at least yes. in two primary respects. The first one is that they only have one business. Mm -hmm. They have only have one job to do. And that simplifies life so much. Hello. Give me almost any company more than 10 years old and they have more than one job to do. Mm -hmm. May not be smart, to agree to do more than one job, but they have decided to do that. And also, in addition to only doing that one job, they have no legacy. Mm -hmm. They have no ties to rigid structures, mm -hmm. either those customer expectations, employee expectations, contracts, mm -hmm. governments, what, what have you. Mm -hmm. So you can't do strategy in the same way in startups and in existing larger companies. Absolutely. And Rita, you've been talking about this, that you know the big companies have certain advantages even over the over the newcomers, as in your recent article with Ryan. Mm -hmm. So the, the startups do differently the strategy, but it's not the it's not the only way. Well, a couple of things. Um, there's a wonderful joke that, that, that I like on the subject of legacy. And the line goes something like, sure, God created the world in seven days, but he didn't have an installed base. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, it, 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 but from the startup entrepreneur's point of view, you, do, you don't have the legacy to support you. Exactly. You actually well, right. have to figure it yeah. out yourself. So a couple of things that I think are worth remembering. Um, startups have an incredibly high rate of failure. 
you know, so startups are really a hypothesis about what could be true. And most of the time they're wrong. So, you know, when you talk about strategy and startups, you're talking about almost genetic mutations on the economic system and most mutations are fatal. So, so I really think it's important. We all, we, we, we all collectively suffer from incredible survivor bias. So when we think of startups, we think of the ones that worked. You know, we, we forget about the, you know, the 90% that didn't work. So I think when you're talking about strategy and startups, I think it's important to remember startups themselves are really experiments. Um, whereas a larger established firm has, it has a business model that exists. It has assets that it owns. It, you know, they're, they're, it's proven out some hypothesis about business that has eventually worked and then and then the question is as Risto says you know as you get to a certain level of maturity you have more than one thing you're trying to do and as environments change you need to adapt if you're going to continue as an ongoing enterprise so i think there's there's a really almost qualitative difference between something that's really just a business experiment and something that's really an ongoing you know enterprise at the same time as Rita said earlier I think larger companies are getting some behaviors that, that are VC-like. Mm -hmm. Larger companies are becoming a little bit like venture capital companies mm -hmm. yeah. with a portfolio of projects, some of which are internal R&D projects, some of which are you know, separately branded small entities within the larger company that have been given freedom from some of the internal processes and, and constraints that can be easily spun off. Some of them have been already spun off. Some of them may, may be becoming completely independent with also external investors in them. Some of them may be companies that we are preparing to acquire. Mm -hmm. We are following a thousand different competitors, some small and large, with the idea that at least we know what they do and maybe we will try to acquire them. So, a wide portfolio of different types of investments with different types of risks. Then if we just are able to make the right decisions at the right time, we can optimize our risk. Whereas a single startup always has absolute risk. Mm -hmm. All in. It's always all in. So what can we take? from these all-in situations to learn and maybe some of the characteristics to adopt in the big companies. What's the entrepreneurial mindset, Rita? Well, I think the principle of converting assumptions to knowledge is something that big companies can really benefit from. I mean, to me, the entrepreneurial mindset is this continual renewal of your competitive advantage. You know, it's it's recognizing that what made you great, you know, 10 years ago is unlikely to continue to make you great uh, in, and, you know, in an open, in a competitive market um, that that competitors will copy and, and that, you know, people will catch up. So you need to be continually renewing your sources of advantage. And, and, you know, Nokia is a wonderful example of this. I mean, over the many decades the company's been in existence, I mean, it's gone from fundamentally different business models, you know, as it, as it's developed. Um, and it's a company I, even today I really admire. And so, you know, this idea of, of, of discovering the next path for yourself is, is really core to what being entrepreneurially minded means as a large organization, I think. And as said, the strengths and weaknesses of startups and existing established companies are very different. Mm -hmm. One of the, and, and of course, you have to know your strengths and weaknesses. You have to capitalize on the strengths. Mm -hmm. And one of the big strengths that large companies should envy from startups is the speed of decision making. Mm -hmm. And that is such an important thing when you try to find your way to a, a stable business model, to doing the right job well. And you don't need to wait for the next board meeting with a PowerPoint deck to get permission. <laughs> yep. You find out something in the morning and you have already decided what you will do differently by noon. Mm -hmm. And how do we enable that in larger companies for 
sort of separated entities, small teams that have been given a mission and they really believe that they can execute. And if we can do that, they will actually have a sense of ownership. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they will exercise entrepreneurial leadership. So we need small reconnaissance teams to, to go out and do their thing. Rita, what do you think of these? Absolutely. Um, what I talk about a lot is managing across a portfolio of uncertainties where in the core you've got people whose main job is really executing in operations but as you move into higher at levels of uncertainty you've got essentially options for the future and that's much more experimental and and you know quick decision making quick gathering of information and i think it's really important though to know who's doing what <laughs> because a lot of companies either they tilt way more toward the core and new thinking isn't really prioritized or the opposite cases they're all about options and then they under manage uh, the, the, the core ongoing operations that's that's true um there was a question an audience question about how do you build more like a startup culture for this new business development or venturing unit? How do you I build a startup culture? From finding the right team and the right leader. How do we, Rita, what do you think? How do we build for these people the culture that supports them to, to do it for real, not the theater? Yeah. Well, so um, my research suggests there's at least three important leadership roles. Uh, the first is really the executive leader that kind of sets the broad strategy. And by that, I just mean, what's the framework for making choices? Then you've got the entrepreneurs, the people that are starting, you know, new businesses, new ventures, new, new things. And those are very often people with a very different mindset about what success means than um, the more traditional uh, organizations. And then you've got these people in the middle. And Risto, I'd be interested in your perspective on this. I call them Sherpas. So, you know, if you're going to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, right, you need a Sherpa. Somebody is going to look around and say, oh, whoa, whoa, wind is coming from that direction. We don't want to take that path. We want to take this other path. In other words, someone who knows the organization and can mitigate between what the startups are trying to do within the organization and what the, parent, what the mothership needs, right? And what I've found is that's a, a, a role that doesn't need to exist in a startup. A, a pure startup, but it's a role that desperately is needed in, a, in if you want innovation to succeed in a large organization. Well, absolutely, I fully agree. It, of course, likely depends on whether you're doing something that would continue to be somewhat of a separate business from the core business of the larger entity, in which case you don't need to have that many ties between the two organizations. But if it's something that should change the way the, the mothership operates <laughs> and you need to nurture those ties mm -hmm. from an early age without slowing down the, the startup but you don't but you don't necessarily know from the outset whether this will be something that changes our core business or the our play and in the you arena should optimize for speed yeah you can always act later to slow things down by creating more ties yes it's much harder to do it in the other direction true mm -hmm. but how do you do we even recognize these shepherds we are in when you mention about them we immediately actually think few people but they're not talked about no exactly. oh it's one of the hidden it's one of the big mysteries of corporate entrepreneurship people don't it's an unspoken role. And if you think about it, what are they actually doing with their day, right? Nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, they're making a phone call to, to calm people down because something the entrepreneur did pissed somebody off. 10 o'clock to <clears> 11 o'clock, <throat> they're fighting over resources with somebody. 11 o'clock, you know, it's a very political, in the, in the positive sense of the word, political job. You're trying to move hearts and minds, but, but it's an almost um, in, a, in a resource allocation and uh, kind of human resource point of view, it's almost an invisible job. And when it's done right, it actually is an invisible job. You know, pe people don't want to know that they've been influenced by this person. So it's it's a very interesting uh, role. Invisible job sounds like difficult to get funding for. <laughs> yes. 
But if I may go back to the previous discussion of what we had just said, when you set up an internal startup, if you can try to staff it from all the departments, divisions, mm -hmm. functions that you have in the mothership, so that you have a really diverse team that knows the, the mothership really well. And have the links. And therefore will have the links. But of course you need to find the right type of people also yeah. from all around the, the mothership. Okay, so you need to find the share of us. Um, this is an interesting discussion because for what, what we get from our community, many of who are these entrepreneurial leaders who lead the initiatives in their respective organizations is that I'm starting to think that the, the, the single biggest role in innovation and this kind of venturing is the people who support the people who run them. The supporters, the key supporters, you may call them Sherpas, or in executive level. The support is actually more important than the entrepreneurial leaders or the innovators themselves. Could this be true? For a large company? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think it makes it's it makes the difference. I mean, if you think about it, you don't want your entrepreneurs reporting directly to your senior leadership. First of all, senior leadership has a lot of different things they're supposed to be doing, right? <laughs> and and uh, secondly, they speak completely different lang. They have different time frames, different languages. It's a it, it, you need you need some buffering force in between. You agree? Yeah, I, I would prefer not labeling people more important and less important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bad practice. Yes. So, in that sense, I don't agree. Good. But any any leader needs to build their team. Yep. And the team is all important. Mm -hmm. If the team doesn't work, then the, the leader fails. Any any leader without followers is just a guy taking a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but it's, it's, it's true, we don't always recognize the Sherpas or the support we get uh, or give. Um, time's running. So I will ask you both the, the, the key question today, which you know, lots of our listeners are interested in. Okay, I need to rethink our my strategy. What's the next? What's the first thing I do uh, to today or Monday? Krista, would you like to go first? Well, I think the, the objective of that first thing to do would be to understand, of course, the, the environment. Mm -hmm. Assuming you already understand it as you should, then you have to have a strategy to identify the alternatives. What are the scenarios? How do you end up with a set of reasonable scenarios? And you have a process for that. You have to decide what process you will use. And then you implement that and you will learn to understand the future environment better by identifying those scenarios to which you also link actions that you can start implementing right away. So it becomes action oriented. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a, a huge waterfall type process, which ends at a particular date and then you give presentations to the mm -hmm. board and you have a strategy for the next 12 months. It mm -hmm. can really be a living thing. And you continuously identify new questions and ways of getting answers to those questions and they will be in as input to the scenarios that you have in place and they will influence the actions you take. Mm -hmm. It becomes running the business, it becomes a, almost a daily leadership job because, well, it's, okay. action, yes. because it's action oriented. Yep. That's what leaders do. Mm -hmm. They identify and implement actions. Is it easy to to get the people to understand the 
or, or figure out the actions, the immediate actions, as you said earlier, because lots of times we see people analyze. But they, how do you turn that analysis into action? Well, it typically happens very easily if you just tell them that the objective is to identify actions. People sometimes have a misconception that strategic planning is very far away from actions. Mm -hmm. But if you just tell them that, hey, we are doing a good job, you have identified a long list of actions, then that's the outcome. Mm -hmm. It's not more difficult than that. Great. Rita, aspiring strategist needs to rethink. What, what, do, you do? what do you do first? I I, with an established organization, um, I often start with where we are, you know, uh, because a lot of strategists sort of say, oh, let's start with our goals. You know, what's our objective? And I'm sorry, you know, I'm a certain height and I'm a certain age and there's no way I'm going to be a supermodel. So if that was my goal, I'm going to be very disappointed. So I think you need to start with what's in your portfolio? What are your capabilities? Sort of where are you? And then, as 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 Risto said, then then I think you need to really look at what's going on externally. What's the arena you want to play in? Where do those capabilities lend themselves? I mean, one of the most inspiring things I think about the current COVID crisis has been how many organizations have pivoted super rapidly into producing yeah. goods that are relevant to the now. You know, um, one of my favorite examples is a company called Timberlane. They they make shutters, beautiful custom made shutters. And nobody's buying beautiful custom made shutters right now, but they're buying an awful lot of protective equipment. So the whole company is just pivoted to uh, producing those goods uh, that are desperately needed. And, and I think that's just really interesting when you think about six months ago, that was not their strategy. Today, it's the core of what they're doing. Yeah. We see lots of pivoting happening these days, I think mm -hmm. is the word of the day. Mm -hmm. um, but as we discussed, otherwise is that lots of things will stay the same. People want to connect, they want the electricity. Um, so not not everything is in, in turmoil in that sense. I want to thank you both for this wonderful discussion. Uh, I do hope that we can one day to convene, uh, have a, maybe a fire, so the, for the fireside chat and, and <laughs> Deep, dig deeper in this is very interesting subject area, which both of you are very knowledgeable. Thanks a lot, Rita. Thanks a lot, Thank Rita. Uh, so nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, yeah, great to meet you. A business, um, business legend in Finland. It's great. We need to do this again. I'd we, love it. I'd absolutely love it. Yes, and I'm, I'm coming to that. Um, I want to extend a great thanks to the, the technology industries team who's been supporting us. Um, we wouldn't have managed, obviously, without you. But it's, it's been marvelous to make this happen and have all these people from all around the world to participate. Um, and from my part, for the end, is that if, if you're looking to revamp your strategy, then utilize your people. I know that. In all of your organization, there are wonderful people who have been thinking about the different possibilities, avenues, and innovations for your organization. Utilize those people, whether you call them entrepreneurial leaders or not. But you have wonderful people. And as Steve Blank said, get out of the building, talk to the customers, talk to the others to, to get the lay of the land, uh, as Arun said. And, and from our part, we are, of course, trying to support this new level of entrepreneurship across all the organizations. So I would be happy to invite you all to join the movement to help the entrepreneurs and grow as leaders. And finally, I do hope that we can convene again hopefully in January, in a physical, real Collaborate for Crowd 2021, a recrowd edition. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. <laughs> Bye -bye.